Um, today, I'm going to talk about from scalability to inclusion. And I'm going to touch on a few concepts. Uh, the last um, DEF CON that I was at was two years ago in Shanghai. And the last two days, I've been attending a lot of talks. And I see there's a great difference. And I'm, I'm going to go through the summary and um, just discuss what we have. Um, I think you have talked a lot about technical scalability over the last two days, and as, as well as two days on layer one and layer two. Um, I'm not going to touch on that, but I'm going to go back in time to where Nick Zabo talked about social scalability, which I think um, Vitalik has talked a little bit about that uh, over the last two weeks, about social scalability. It is the ability to overcome the mindset, and it is a mindset who limits who and how many can successfully part participate. And that's key to mass adoption. It is about human limitations, not about technological lim limitations or physical resource constraints that we are talking about. And if you look back, I have five Ds for this scalability for crypto economies. And the five Ds are all there. Um, I'm going to go through every single one of them. It is a process that you will see that possibly um, our community will go through, and the first one is digitalization. And digitalization is about having new business model using digitization. So digitalization is different from digitization. And we're using digitization to come up with new model. And what we are seeing now are some very interesting development. A lot of people are trying to tokenize a legal entity, which what Satoshi has given us a gift not to deal with legal entity. So now we're going backwards and try to tokenize a legal entity. And by tokenizing legal entity, there's a lot of costs. The cost of governance, the compliant costs, and you stop yourself from going cross-border. And those are the costs that is in embedded in trying to tokenize securities. And token securities has its own risk and return characteristics. And you now put a layer of token, which is technology on top, your technology risk management has to be good, and you have increased the risk of the product, but at the same time, you may only increase efficiency by a little. And I'm not too sure how much of mass adoption you can find because you're serving the same customer, you're having the same business model. There's no improvement from what Satoshi has given us from 10 years ago. So instead of that, we always talk about security token. The other idea is to is token security. We tokenize anything that is not securitized. We tokenize anything that is not in a legal form. For example, a cow token, a livestock token. And in that case, you then have a new set of token law to take care of um, token security. So we may want to move to a different direction from security to token to token security because it releases us from all the localized uh, legal and legislation that we have to deal with. So this is where um, our mindset, which is the uh, scalability, social scalability, is to bring the excluded assets back to the economic and financial system through digitalization. And that is what inclusion and adopt, mass, adopt, mass adoption is about. And the second and third day is this intimidation and democratization. I gave the example of the livestock token. You can tokenize a cow, which is not a legal entity. Um, you can you can intermediate the rent-seeking lenders who charge 100% in Myanmar. We have somebody from Myanmar who knows that. And we can actually then put them onto a insurance scheme, micro-insurance scheme, because now you have a token, you know the GPS position, you now have it on blockchain, you have the identity of the farmers, the insurance company, they are willing to insure. And once the insurance are willing to insure, you lower the risk of that product. And the risk is lowered, you will be able to get the micro lending to lend at single digit or double digit. And we have reduced the lending rate from 100% to single digit or double digit. And that is the beauty of token security. Um, and the mindset is to balance the profit and social objectives. So that is another mindset that we must have in mass adoption because charity is not going to help us to do mass adoption at all. You have to combine both profit motives as well as social objectives for sustainability. And the fourth D is decentralization. 
fintech companies are good for inclusion. We have seen that in Alipay, we have seen that in Kenya, um, 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 M-Pesa and so on, but they are still centralized. Okay, that is the major problem of doing financial inclusion through centralized. No government would like to have a centralized fintech company in their country that control the entire payment system. So that is the danger of a centralized system. And what is decentralization? Decentralization is actually, to me, a dynamic and continuous process of distribution of trust. And that is key to a lot of design thinking that we might, must have. And whatever blockchain that you have, whatever decentralization at Genesis is always centralized. So when you try to do decentralization, it is a continuous process. Okay, a decentralized system can be centralized tomorrow if they're left with two of us doing the mining. So that is a thought that we must have at the back of our mind. And we always must remember that off-chain governance are mostly centralized. So there must be a distinction between on-chain and off-chain governance. And we don't mix them out. When we talk about decentralization, it's decentralized on-chain. And most of the time, off-chain off off governance is centralized. And we can do better off-chain and on-chain to distribute trust. Okay? And especially on the child chains as well where we start. So it is important when we have an inclusive blockchain with open blockchain, private blockchain, consortium blockchain, second layer, third layer, child chains that we start with centralized governance, but we need to continuously decentralize trust. And the mindset is a dynamic distribution of trust. And that is very important for mass adoption. And the fifth D is diminishing oneself. And that is the best act of Satoshi Nakamoto. He disappeared uh, besides being diminishing himself, he disappeared and there's no single point of attack, there's no single point of failure, and this is the hardest and the most essential. Okay? We can look at a lot of corporate, uh, corporate fiat stablecoin, which is doing the reverse. Instead of disintermediating, we are dis disintermediating. So we are adding another layer of intermediary in the design thinking of the coin that we have when we try to put something in between. Okay, so we, we shouldn't be this, this intimidating. Okay, and if you are, are maximalist, then we are we making ourselves as a center. And if you are super nose, you are drawing attention to yourself. And that is the mindset that we need to have, which is we are just facilitators. We are all just facilitators. We are all here just facilitators. And our task is to minimize a single point of attack and failure. And that is our mission. Um, that's why we are here in Prague. Okay. And the signs are not good for the community. For the, over the year, we can see there's still a lot of concentration of mining. Yes, there's ASIC resistance. We're talking about concentration of wealth. We're talking about concentration of developers. Um, we still need a lot more education. We are continue to expose ourselves to third-party trust in both soft and hardware that we're talking about in the last few days. So, we, we have security token, we have scam ICO, we have fiat stablecoin, which actually distracted us from what we tried to do from 10 years ago, which is to distribute trust and lower the cost of trust so that our dependence on third-party trust is at the lowest. So we have the first layer versus the second layer where it's difficult to get consensus in the governance of chain, but it's better to have changes and innovation on the second layer because it's a little bit more centralized. Whether those are the good development, um, we'll leave it to everybody to decide, but we need more than technical and social scalability for mass adoption. And the focus and switch in this few days. And what we have seen in these few days is a lot of talk about zero knowledge proof, a lot about secure multi-party computing, a lot more about full homomorphic encryption, and very little about secret sharing, okay? But data and smart contract privacy, pen testing, code audit, and we are talking about open source software as well as open source hardware. And that is interesting. But again, we need to think about distribution of trust because third-party trust is something that we have set out to ensure that it's minimized. So when we look at all this, um, well, trusted executor environment and SGX and more that we have, we have to bear in mind the design thinking of distribution of trust for mass adoption, okay? And safe mass adoption, privacy protection mass adoption. And the success, though not perfect, of privacy protection is drawing attention worldwide. And this is what the community has done well 
in terms of uh, impressing a lot of um, um, investors as well as government in the world, mass adoption will be triggered by more major hacks. And as soon as there are more hacks, especially when your Prime Minister data is stolen, and health data is stolen, like a country like Singapore, we will pay more attention to crypto. And I'm sure a lot of you know that um, the country I come from, Singapore, our, data, our health data has been stolen. And what is never discussed a lot in this conference is where is the sustainable demand coming from? Because throughout the two days, a lot of us were discussing about the supply side, the technology, scalability, and also social scalability. But where is the demand coming from? We are talking about mass adoption. So it's important to look at decentralized financial inclusion. And that's the key to mass adoption, and it entails quite a few things. This is the statistics that we need to know. 1% control 50% of the wealth, 1% uh, entitled to 82% of the income last year. This is the kind of situation we are in, and we have a big numbers who are willing to join this community. And we have to bring them back to join us. And this is what mass adoption is about. It's about the demand side. Okay, the beauty of it is that in these countries, these countries are not in that, <clears throat> they're all in Asia, okay, they have 100% handphone penetration and we have a digital revolution and there are at least 438 million in 10 countries in ASEAN, Asia or Southeast Asian nation, that are ready to be served. And 73% of them do not have a bank account they have a handphone, they have a cow. You can tokenize the cow on the handphone, but they don't have utilities, they have no toilets, but they have a handphone and they love blockchain. So that's why we should be there. Okay. <clears throat> so the demand is decentralized inclusion. The greatest demand comes from the excluded. The excluded are the customers that we have. These are the people and as said, we, are con we, are, we have to try to convert their asset to live digital assets. We shouldn't be working with stocks and shares. We shouldn't be working with real estate. We shouldn't be working with that instruments. Or we work with them, but with less energy in those areas. The community should direct the attention to trying to convert all the dead assets to live digital assets. Like a cow to a farmer, like a sheep to a farmer tokenizing the non-securities, and then securitize the tokens is what we should do. Not to tokenize the security and then subject ourselves to another layer of legal uh, compliance. We just need one layer, which is to tokenize non-securities and then look for a new token law and request the government to have a new token law and not subject ourselves to old securities law, commodity laws, and so on. We want new token laws. Okay, and fractionalized account that you can own 10%, 5% account, Imiyama, right here in Prague, and heterogenized, and now you can own the calf, different from the cow, you can have the milk, different from the cow. These are all the things that we can tokenize with IoT, with convergence of technology and by serving the underserved. And we can, we can solve the greatest mystery of all this economy is going to leapfrog because they have no regulation to deal with any of this. We devise our new token law so that they can get cheap capital via globalized crypto um, funding that we have here for them. And there's a convergence of tech. And this is next stage I will see in the next three to four years. I can see most conf conferences talking about convergence of tech where blockchain is, is the driver, where Ethereum is the driver. And sustainable green business model that we don't destroy any more forests. We use drones who are on the blockchain. We use mesh network who is on the blockchain. We use satellite payments using token. We do not want to build more roads and destroy more forests. We just want to use blockchain to do a lot more green advancement. So this is the 10 critical enablers for mass adoption. They may be contradicting to each other, but this is what I thought of. You have to have fast, stable internet connection. And if there's no internet, we can use mesh network. And that can be tokenized. We, can use, we, we need to have interoperable value transfer gateway. We need to have privacy protection for user. We need strong security framework, which we talked about the last two days. We need open source and trust distribution governance. And this is lacking. We need to discuss about governance amongst ourselves, self-governance. Digital literacy and UX, which is still very weak. 
We need digital ID. Okay? We need compliance easy. Okay? We do not want to subject to the existing law. We don't mind to subject to the assist, to new laws that is favorable to the token world, but not old regulation. And comprehensive data and Oracle ecosystem, which we talked about decentralized Oracle yesterday, and talent, knowledge, and skills, which is why we are all here to exchange views and share whatever we have. Now, this is the market size. Look at that for remittances, welfare, aid, donation, ownership of data, healthcare. Have you ever found yourself donating to a charity and you never found where your money goes? So this company, ATAC, they have remittances looking, they have welfare um, transfer, aid transfer and healthcare. It is a profitable business. It's a combination of profit motives with social objectives. And this is the direction we should go, go using blockchain with more transparency. And this is the market size. It is big. It can accommodate many of us. Just not, there's just not enough people working in those areas. And we have the first, first baby born on blockchain. And this is also a company that we, we invested in. Because when you're a refugee, you have no identity. You have to be given an identity. Once you have identity, you want to give birth. You need money. So what happens is that ATAD has given the money. The lady could go to the hospital and give birth. Now, the danger is that when the baby is born, whatever medical expenses is taken away by syndicate. And again, blockchain will allow the expenses be spent specifically in the hospital for medicine for the baby. So this is the baby on um, the, block, the blockchain, and it is not a myth. It is already happening. Okay? And know what? you know what? Government are now investing into blockchain. Singapore government, um, Irish government, they're all investing in token blockchain projects. And then in Myanmar, you have the cow token, which I mentioned. It is not a dream. It is already life. Okay? You can tokenize a cow, and you can, you can see the years. Is there's a tag. Once you break it, there's no more insurance. But basically, this is how you tag onto your blockchain. And again, the government roll out red carpet, 60 million counts to be tokenized. This, these, are, these are the projects that can be on Ethereum or can be on a lot of other uh, blockchain that we can talk about. And have you ever heard about cypherpunk government? Isn't it an oxymoron, right? Well, what is happening in Singapore? Wubin won, using Ethereum as sing dollars for international payment. Okay, it's already done. Okay, Wubin 2 has just been announced. Okay, and we have Coda, we have uh, Hyperledger, and we also have Quorum. And they're using encryption. They're using zero knowledge. And this is Central Bank. I'm talking Central Bank who knows more about different technology than sometimes than us. And then the open trade blockchain by the government. That, and the government is agnostic and harness the best technology and they expand into the open virtual space. And the best thing, you look at the report. You just Google Ubin2. The report says that they will diminish itself by providing infrastructure. They are like Satoshi. The government will diminish themselves. Okay? So you here see the last two, three slides. is the excluded will change the world because mass adoption comes from the exclusion. Okay? If you are doing exactly the same thing as the government and corporate, then it is not sustainable because they can do it better than you. You try to do security, I don't think you'll be better than any exchanges. That's why the ease of compliance is key. Too much of a developed economy thinking in design. For example, why think about a Ricardian contract where you can have a new token legislation? Just go over new token legislation. There are many, many countries in the world that will be able to have that. And that's why investment should go to places that lay out the red carpet, and there are many more of them who want to work with the Ethereum um, community. And convergence on technology brings convergence of profit and social objectives. For the first time in history, we are not charity. We could do that. That's why the leapfrogging economy may have mass adoption before others, because there's no regulation and so on. So last slide. The complete, we are here to complete the system, not to compete with existing organizations like the corporates or the government, because blockchain with token incentivizes collaboration. We are not talking about production efficiency, making it cheaper, faster, better. We are talking about collaboration efficiency and the token itself allows us to align our interests 
And this is important. We are here to complete the ecosystem. We are not here to compete. We are here to serve, not to rule. We don't make ourselves as the centre. And this is important to note that perhaps uh, the Manifesto 2.0 may have to be rewritten. This is just my view. And that's all I have for you today. Um, thank you very much. I think I have uh, four minutes for questions. Oh, um, what is the support for the idea that part of what will help mass adoption is um, pr uh, supporting privacy concerns? Like, I, mean, I know that that's a huge concern here, but I don't get the impression from the way people currently use uh, the internet that that is the concern of many people. Of course, that might be my view coming from certain like, Western places. Yeah. I, I think that's the key to it. It's all about privacy protection. The entire exercise is about privacy protection, and the entire exercise is about having independent decision. So every nodes of blockchain, every single individual for their own human dignity, we must have our own independent decisions, and we have to ensure that by having privacy protection. So it's, it's very important to focus on a lot of, I think the last few days we talked a lot about um, combination of AI and blockchain so that we can do a lot of analysis without actually knowing what is the metadata and the raw data itself. So I agree with you that this is something we need to do. And it's important to work with government that are willing to diminish themselves so that allowing individuals to have their own privacy. And this is, this is key to um, the, the entire exercise and what we are talking about here. Um, perhaps I didn't bring it uh, out very clearly um, is exactly what, what it is about privacy protection. Not only about privacy protection, but also a lot more data that we have. Yeah. Yeah, there's no more question there. Um. Hello. Um, so I am, when it, when it comes to sort of development initiatives and, and, and tech stuff, helping development, I, I tend to be on the cynical side. And I think that's kind of an important thing to do is, is think about the risks and think about the, what can go wrong and what can go bad. And, and if you've seen, uh, Zuckerberg testifying, uh, you know, everybody sort of watched this. Um, and Myanmar was referenced many times, and the adoption, the mass adoption, the really quick, and I think what you're talking about is true, is in, in these greenfield markets, people will adopt something very, very quickly. When that happens, I want to know, in your opinion, in the, perhaps maybe in the context of ASEAN, um, what are the big risks, where are, the, where are the risk points? Yeah, I think financial literacy is one of the most important thing and also privacy protection literacy, which very few people talk about. And I totally agree with you that we have to be very careful because uh, technology is actually neutral. Uh, even though blockchain is a little bit more for the weak, for the small, uh, for the neglected, but uh, it's about human, the human itself that can misuse the technology and we don't have the wisdom, we could de destroy the entire human race. And that's the fear that we all have with AI and the rest and not so much with blockchain. But still, we have to be very careful. And what you say is correct. But I see new business model coming out that people who are not privacy protect, protection lit literate or financial literate, uh, there are new business models that we can help them to ensure that, again, we have a trusted third party. And how do we decentralize or de distribute the trust of this trusted third party new model that actually protect the private keys or protect their own human dignity? We need to think deeper. And this is what I'm here today for, to trigger the thinking about we need to continuously distribute trust. We should never stop. We should never stop. And we should continue to not to trust the third party, but we cannot avoid it. It is a process that we have to trust the first party, just like there were only two people mining um, Bitcoin t um, 10 years ago when we first started, just Hale and, and Satoshi. So they started as a centralized Bitcoin. 
and then they start to become decentralized, but it has to be a continuous process. So we need to continuously to remind us in our design thinking, whatever we design, whether it's an enclave for encrypted data that we draw out, or whatever, or it's an oracle which is decentralized, we make sure that we have this effort of continuously distributing trust non-stop. And that's the only way we can protect ourselves. Okay, I don't know whether I answered my question to you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.